to look at the next in our series of parables and we're looking at the parable of the tenants in the vineyard um, and I'm going to be reading from Matthew chapter 21. Um, Phil's already pointed out that this parable is one of few that actually occur in all three of the synoptic gospels. Uh, of course John's gospel is a quite different gospel from many of the others and I think there's only one instance where the word parable is used in John's gospel and we'll come to that at the end of our series but otherwise all of the parables tend to be found in the first three gospels and there are actually only three which are found in all three and we've had all of those so far we've had the parable of the sower we've had the parable of the mustard seed and now we come to the parable of the vineyard interestingly all three of them have a kind of agricultural theme and a theme of uh, growth of plants and so on. But another interesting feature is that all three of them also um, have a negative side to them. They have something that goes wrong. So there's the positive side of the growth of the, uh, and so on, but there's a negative side to it. Uh, and certainly this parable has that aspect to it. Just before we read a passage and we go into it, one other interesting fact about this particular parable um, it comes in a series of three parables now last week we've already had the first in that series was the parable about the two sons who were asked to go and work in the vineyard uh, in their in their father's on their father's farm um, and then next week we're going to be having another parable which comes in the beginning of chapter 22 and that is the parable about the marriage um, feast and the common feature between these three is they all have reference to sons. So in the first parable, there were two sons, one who did what his father wanted, one who didn't. In this particular parable, we're going to again come across a son. In this case, it's a son who gets rejected and even killed by the tenants in the vineyard. And then next week, the parable will be talking about the marriage of a son. And so that's an interesting linking feature. But in terms of where they fit into Matthew's gospel, they all come right at the very end of the ministry of the Lord Jesus. We're now in the very last week of his life. And the key thing to bear in mind as far as the background is concerned is that the leaders of the Jewish people are seeking to destroy Jesus. They've got a plan to have him arrested, to be tried and to be executed. And of course, that is what will actually happen. Uh, it doesn't come as a surprise to the Lord Jesus because he's already said many times to his disciples, particularly towards the end of this period, he's been telling them this is exactly what is going to happen. And so it's not something that will take him by surprise. So that's the background, the rising tension between him and the Jewish leaders. Many of the people still support the Lord Jesus or are certainly interested in hearing what he has to say. And when he came into Jerusalem on the donkey earlier in this chapter, he was applauded by the people and he was welcomed by the people. But behind the scenes, the Jewish leaders are seeking to destroy him. And that will be very relevant when we come to this particular parable today. So let's just read the parable itself in Matthew chapter 21. Uh, let's just get the words up here. Thank you. Um, and Matthew chapter 21, starting from verse 33. Here another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence round it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than at first and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their season. Now just take note of the fact that having given the parable, the Lord Jesus tells this parable, he 
pointedly asks a question at the end. He says, what's the vineyard owner going to do under these circumstances? And the leaders of the people who are listening to him that he's speaking to, they say, well, surely he's going to put these miserable wretches to death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruit in their season. And we'll see what the meaning behind this is in a moment. But let's just think about this parable as the Lord Jesus told it. And it's a parable about a vineyard. Now, I've already said that the background or the context of this is that there is tension with the religious rulers who have effectively already rejected Jesus Christ and his claims. He had come saying that he was the son of God. He had come as someone from God, and yet they had decided that they weren't prepared to accept him. I think many of these leaders had already recognized who he was, but they just weren't willing to accept his authority and his claims. And they're planning not only to reject him, but to actually try to destroy him. And so here's the vineyard. Here's the parable of the vineyard. And to the people that were listening, they would have immediately understood what the Lord Jesus was talking about. Now, for us, perhaps it wouldn't be so obvious. But the people listening were steeped in the Old Testament. And there are various places in the Old Testament where the symbol uh, or the picture of the vineyard is used. Three particular passages in Psalm 80, Isaiah 5, and Isaiah 27, where it talks about a vineyard. And the vineyard is the symbol of the nation of Israel. The vineyard is a picture of what God is looking for. He is looking fruit for fruit from his people. And if you go uh, and look at those particular passages, in particular Isaiah 5, but also the other two passages in Psalm 80 and Isaiah 27, you'll read the background to this, that all these people would have been familiar with, that this, they couldn't help but realize the Lord Jesus was telling a parable that was about them, about their nation. He was telling a parable about Israel itself. In fact, in Isaiah chapter um, five, it actually speaks about um, it speaks about the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel itself. That's Isaiah five and verse seven. So it's quite clear that uh, in terms of who the Lord Jesus is speaking to, he's talking about the nation of Israel itself, the very people that he's living amongst. He's talking to at the time. But of course, the key feature of this particular parable about the vineyard is in relation to the people who were given the responsibility of looking after the vineyard. At the beginning of the story, the owner himself went away and he left the vineyard in the care of tenants, tenant farmers. So it was their responsibility to cultivate it and to look after it. And so we come to the tenants of the vineyard, those who are given that responsibility. And sadly, they completely abused that trust that was given to them. In the story, the tenants, uh, when the time for fruit came and the servants were sent, they beat them, they stoned them, they actually killed some of them. And that's the way they treated their master. Because these servants, of course, were representing the master. They had come to uh, collect what the master was owed and what the master should be given. And sadly, that's the way they treated it. What they were doing was not so much abusing the servants, but abusing the master himself and saying what they thought of him. Now, clearly in the parable, and this, this comes out very clearly at the end, we haven't actually read the verse at the end uh, uh, later on in the chapter, but the leaders of the people immediately perceived that the Lord Jesus was referring to them. These leaders represent the very, uh, these tenants rather, represent the leaders of the people of Israel. In verse 45, it says, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this par the, his parables, not just this one, but others as well in this series, they perceived that he was talking about them. And so they immediately knew what he was saying. What he was saying was, this is the way you have treated God's messengers that have been sent to you. And it certainly rings true with the Old Testament. As you read through the Old Testament, you find over and over again, God sent prophets to his people. He sent messengers to the people of God, telling them, for example, where they were going wrong, telling them where they were sinning, asking them and calling them to repentance, calling them to return to God's ways. 
and every single one of them pretty well was treated in this way they were all abused they were some of them were killed some of them were stoned some of them various different things were done to them exactly as the parable says it and interestingly of course where we know the background that the very leaders at that time these chief priests and pharisees who heard this parable what were they actually doing behind the scenes they were planning to destroy not just a servant but the son of god himself and of course that brings us on to the climax of the story but before we do that let's just think about these leaders of the people the scribes and the pharisees a couple of chapters later um, as this conflict between the Lord Jesus and these leaders comes to a climax, eventually they leave and they, they try to question him, they try to trip him up, and they just fail to do it miserably. And eventually they just left and went off. And the Lord Jesus then spoke to the crowds. And this is part of what he said about these leaders. And these words, when you read them, they fit exactly in with this very chapter, this very parable. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. This is Matthew 23, verse 29. For you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous. Listen to these words. This is what they were saying. If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. They knew their own history, that their people had constantly been killing off the prophets sent by God. Thus, you witness against yourself that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you brood of vipers. How are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore, I sent you the prophets and the wise men and the scribes, some of whom you would kill and crucify, and some you would flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of innocent Abel to the blood of Zachariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. So this parable was explained in explicit detail by the Lord Jesus, effectively by these words, as well as what we have read earlier on in the chapter. There was no doubt, nobody could in any doubt what this parable meant. The Lord Jesus was giving a very pointed message. You leaders in this current time are no better than those in the past. You say, well, we wouldn't do what our fathers did, but you do it anyway. You know, I suppose we, we're all a bit like that, aren't we? We probably all think we wouldn't make the same mistakes other people have made, and yet we end up making probably just the same mistakes as people of old. We don't learn from past history. Well, the climax of the story, of course, is not just the servants that are sent to uh, by the owner of the vineyard, but the son himself. And of course, in the story, they see the son. And I don't know by what sort of contorted logic they thought this would work, but they say to themselves, if we get rid of the son, then we'll take over the vineyard ourselves. Um, I'm sure anyone with any sense would have realized that once they'd killed the son, the, the uh, owner of the vineyard would be back in a flash and he would take vengeance upon them. And of course, that's what would happen. But they decide to kill the son. They show their utter contempt. And in effect, what the Lord Jesus is saying, if you kill the son of God, then you're showing your utter contempt for God. He's effectively predicting what these very leaders are going to do when they take him and crucify him and nail him to the cross. So in this parable, the Lord Jesus Christ himself is the rejected son. And again, later on in the chapter, they were seeking to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they held him to a prophet, to be a prophet. And of course, therefore, they changed their plans and they did it secretly. They paid a man to betray him and they took him at night time, but they were determined to destroy the Lord Jesus himself. So that's basically the parable, and that's the meaning of the parable that was very clear to all those people that were listening to him. And it was clear what the Lord Jesus was saying. It was clear that he was particularly focusing his thoughts upon the leaders, but in a wider sense upon the whole nation itself. But having said that, we need to sort of think about what this is for ourselves. Now, the Lord Jesus didn't finish there. He said some more words afterwards afterwards. 
Um, and I just want to read these words now. This is directly after the parable in the passage, verse 42. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures that the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. The Lord Jesus was warning them about what was going to happen not just to other people, but to this very generation. Just as it said in chapter 23, the passage we've already read, this very generation. Now, history tells us that this very generation pretty well was the generation that saw the destruction of Jerusalem itself. AD 70, some 40 years later, this city, the temple where the Lord Jesus was teaching, would be razed to the ground by the Romans. The nation that took such great pride in being God's people would be removed from the land and would cease to be a nation living in that place anymore. And it would be destroyed. And that situation has carried on ever since. Um, in recent years, of course, uh, there is a, a nation of Israel that's returned to the land, but not, um, not one that really follows God and believes God in the way that they should. So... The words of the Lord Jesus, the judgment that he pronounced, literally came true for that generation. But we've said all that and we say all that and you might well say, well, OK, what's the point of that for me? What's the relevance of that for me? Here's a parable. It's very clear that it was spoken specifically to people in that generation about what they were actually doing to the Lord Jesus himself. And there's absolutely no doubt on what the Lord Jesus meant in this parable. But I just want to draw out three important lessons that are relevant to all of us, whatever generation we live in, wherever situation we may be. And the first is to think about um, a great privilege that there was. Now you think about the vineyard, it was greatly privileged. I've already mentioned Isaiah chapter five, which in a way, perhaps the Lord Jesus based this parable on and certainly must have had in mind when he was reading it, because there in Isaiah chapter five, there is a mini parable about a vineyard. And in that vineyard, in that parable or passage in Isaiah five, it talks about all the things that God did for the vineyard. He built a hedge around it, a wall around it. He built a, a watchtower for protection. He dug out, he took all the stones out so the, the soil would be more productive. He made sure it was planted in a fruitful and a productive place in the first place. He did everything he possibly could to provide the perfect conditions for this vineyard to flourish and produce fruit. And then, of course, he gave it into the hands of tenants to look after in order to produce that fruit. And it's summed up in verse four of Isaiah five, where God says concerning Israel, what more could I do for my vineyard than I have done in it? God had done everything he possibly could. This vineyard and these tenants had an incredibly privileged uh, position. God had done so much for them. And as we think about our own situation, I would guess that all of us, to a greater or lesser extent, are in a very privileged position. I mean, we're privileged in a sense to live in the Western world in relative peace and security and prosperity compared to so many in the world. We're privileged that we have the opportunity to hear God's word, to read the Bible in our own language. Many of you perhaps have been privileged to be brought up in a Christian environment and to have heard the gospel message from a very early age. Great, great privilege. It's you could almost say, what more God could God have done? And as we listen to this message and perhaps listen to God speaking to us about the gospel and the fact that we, each one of us, need to personally trust the Lord Jesus Christ to be our saviour, perhaps we are almost um, dull to the message because of the privilege we have. I wonder whether the tenants of the vineyard almost, they, they'd had it so good, they'd had it so easy that they 
didn't hear the message that was being brought to them. They despised what the owner of the vineyard was saying to them. We're all in a very privileged position. Let's not despise what God, the owner of the vineyard, is saying to us. God is, in a sense, our owner. He's our creator. He's the one who sent the Lord Jesus to die for us. He has every right in our lives, and yet we can so easily despise him and his word. So there was a great privilege, and perhaps that might ring a bell for some of us in our own lives. But then, of course, as well as a great privilege, there was a great responsibility. As far as the tenants were concerned, they were given responsibility to look after the vineyard. And again, referring back to Isaiah chapter 5, verse 4, these are the words of God again. He says, Now, now O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. He's saying to the people of God of that day. The Lord Jesus was saying to the people of God in his day. And perhaps God is speaking to us today as well and saying, judge between me and my vineyard. Judge between me and my people. You know, each one of us has a responsibility with the privilege that we have. If we've heard the gospel, that puts us in a position of responsibility. And we will be judged on that responsibility. It's not something that's trivial. It's not something that's unimportant. You know, the decision we make in terms of the gospel, when we hear the gospel, when we hear God speaking to us and saying to us, you need to be saved, there is a responsibility there. Sadly, these men kept ignoring that, kept despising that responsibility. They kept mistreating the messengers that the master had said until eventually it resulted in their own destruction. And that's what happens when we continually harden ourselves and reject God's word. Ultimately, if we don't repent and trust Christ, then it will result in our own destruction. And that leads me to the last thought. The great judgment. The great judgment that would come upon those who had rejected the word in the, in the parable, of course, is made explicit. But I want to just pick up the words that the Lord Jesus said afterwards. Because here he's quoting from an, a psalm, Psalm 118, a messianic psalm. He's quoting words which speak about himself when he talks about the stone which the builders had rejected has become the chief, the head of the corner. And then he says these kind of enigma, enigmatic words. He says, the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. He talks about people who fall on the stone being broken, but those upon whom the stone falls will be crushed by it. And I think in a way what the Lord Jesus was saying or what this verse is talking about is we have a choice. We can either, as it were, fall upon the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Yes, we will be broken in the sense that we have to acknowledge that we're sinners. We have to acknowledge that we're wrong. It may be a very hard and difficult thing to confess to our sin and to admit what we're really like to God. But if we don't do that, then ultimately the Lord Jesus Christ will be the judge of all who reject him and will be completely crushed by that and destroyed by that. The Bible says that there is a point of the day of judgment and that every one of us must face the Lord Jesus Christ as our judge. And if we don't have him as our saviour, then ultimately we will be judged and we will be destroyed. We will be in hell itself, as the parable talked about. So I want to leave you with this challenge. And from this parable, there's a great privilege that each one of us has, even in the very fact that we get to hear God's word. This brings a great responsibility, but we will also be judged in relation to that privilege and responsibility we have. And I want to challenge each one of us as to whether we have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who God allowed to come and suffer and die, the son who was rejected by this world, but he willingly did that in order to provide the means of salvation for each one of us. It's through his death and through the blood that he shed upon the cross which is pictured in this very parable itself, that we can have the means of salvation 
that allows us to escape the judgment of God and to become the children of God and servants of God.